Hi, everybody. I'm Greg Archibald with Gen2 Advisors, and welcome to the uh, commentary discussion. And I'm joined today with Scott Lindman, a co-founder of Lucy AI. And I want to thank uh, Scott for joining us and thank everyone for tuning in to this. So to get kicked off a little bit, Scott, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and about Lucy AI? Absolutely. So hi, thank uh, Greg, thank you for having me. And as you mentioned, I'm the founder of or co-founder of Lucy. Uh, we've been at it for just under five years uh, and our product is in its third generation. And my history is as an entrepreneur in marketing services and ad tech. I had the good fortune to build one of the early internet services companies and, and sold it back during the dot-com era, uh, built a 150-person digital agency, sold it to WPP and actually ran uh, uh, a big part of JWT, all of their digital in North America for five years, uh, built an ad tech platform uh, um, called Spot by Spot that we sold to Comcast. It's part of their uh, media stack. And then uh, right before creating Lucy, built a 200-person uh, Salesforce consultancy called Magnet 360. So uh, long history in entrepreneurism, uh, working on innovative new technology, uh, and really working with some of the world's biggest brands on how to adopt uh, and change around this sort of technology. So it's been exciting over the last uh, just about five years that we've been on Lucy, uh, evangelizing and creating new technology that affects the world of the insights professional uh, leveraging AI. Well, uh, and you have been through quite a few changes in your career, not only from uh, company to company, but uh, you mentioned before the dot-com bubble. Uh, so congratulations on getting out before that. Uh, but so we had that in, what is it, 99, 2000, something like along those lines. For a while. And, uh, and then we have had the 9-11 um, and, and the Great Recession and uh, just a, uh, now we're in the pandemic. So you've seen a lot of change happen uh, in your professional career through these uh, big events. And one of the things that we did um, <clears throat> early on in the pandemic was uh, an insights leaders roundtable. And uh, every week for about three or four months, we got several leaders from the insights industry and started talking about uh, what was happening, what, what they were seeing. And I want to talk about a little bit about that to set a backdrop for the rest of our discussion. So <clears throat> we all saw that a lot of consumers had changed and how they were engaging with brands, how they were purchasing, um, just uh, how they were saving money or not spending money, not traveling, not going to hotels, et cetera. And we saw businesses changing. Every uh, So many people were working remote that had never worked remotely before. But from a research perspective, we really saw a few themes related to that. A lot of researchers were utilizing existing data for insight into to today's problems. And many of them were going back to data that they had gathered during the Great Recession. Um, they were also, we saw researchers looking for a lot of very fast answers. The reason that they needed fast answers is because changes were happening very fast. Uh, so trying to provide the, the business with some guidance. And many of those have been budget constrained way more than usual. Now, over the course of the past four to five months, I'd say that we've seen some lightening of that, but those were kind of the key themes that we were seeing throughout these discussions. And I just put this up as a backdrop as we start to talk about what you see as the three key tech priorities for 2021. So let's get started with your first one that's in the grit commentary, which is work from home. Um, and one of the ideas that you position there is some of the hallway conversations the casual conversations that move things forward in a less formal way, uh, but still move things forward has been disrupted. It's a business process that's different now. Can you talk a little bit about that and how technology is either replacing or facilitating this? I'm gonna use air quotes around business process. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, and what are the benefits and drawbacks sitting there? 
Yeah. So I'll take one step back and even just in introducing like what was the problem we were solving before this happened? Because we already saw that the kinds of companies we're working with is Fortune 1000 already were working across disparate geographies. And so we built an AI solution uh, that was really about how can everybody have access to an AI and let them get access to all that historical information. Uh, how can they get to all those research reports? How can they get to everything they've already done? And so then as you enter the pandemic, you know, you get to March and the unthinkable happens. You know, nobody's got a playbook for it. We all go home. Governments across the planet are going into lockdown. States in the U.S. are in different measures, um, you know, having uh, creating work from home orders. And so all of a sudden you have this massive disruption and businesses are trying to figure out even you know, who turns on the lights? Do we go to, you know, who goes to the office? Who does this? How do you, how do you operate? And so the thing that we really think about is that, yes, for the last 10 months, the vast majority of knowledge workers and certainly inclusive of all of the market research individuals and, and, and the like, uh, research and insight professionals, um, they're working from home, apartments, studios, they're, they're, they're all over the place. And the thing is that when we think about the forward-looking trend is eventually this all ends. You know, eventually uh, there is, um, people start to have the opportunity to go back to offices and whether it's, you know, two months from now, four months from now, six months from now, that all starts to happen. But the thing is, um, there is gonna be a permanent change in behavior to how we work. And so to that end, you know, I think about it in my own business. Uh, we've got 15,000 square feet in Minneapolis as our corporate headquarters that I haven't visited for 10 months. At some point, we start to have people visit the office, but will they be back five days a week, uh, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day? Or are people going to adjust and say, you know what, it actually worked pretty well working from home. I kind of like that flexibility. You know, I'm going to show up Monday through Wednesday, but I'm still going to take Thursday, Friday at home. Uh, some people won't go back, period. They're going to say, I got a level of flexibility. I got to be present in my kids' lives. And it's going to change. And I think that we're going to see ramifications uh, to how we work that are ongoing. Uh, I'm in a board meeting right after this. 100-person uh, 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 content marketing agency. Uh, great group. And right on the board agenda is going to be what is gonna be the new status post-pandemic for use of the office? When do we downsize the office? By how many square feet? And do we go into a rotation? Do we go back, you know, and uh, do some people permanently work from home? And so I think every business is, or the vast majority of businesses are gonna be having those discussions. What is the, the permanent change that is brought about by what was once unthinkable, which is so many people working remotely, working from home, working offsite, and then how do we continue to support that? How do we make sure that somebody working remotely is completely effective? And the thing is, the same challenge of I work from my home versus my office also relates to um, how do we support different geographies? You know, even in a pre-pandemic world, you have off you know, companies with offices all over the planet. So how do you allow those teams to work together and now it's on steroids because it's how do you work from home, not only just how do you work remote, how do you work in different geographies, but how do you support uh, people being uh, spread out? And then that brings in, you mentioned the water cooler challenge. We, you know, there's always the proverbial, we get to gather around the water cooler. Um, I always thought about it's the first five minutes of meeting or the last five minutes as people are coming into the conference room or leaving the conference room all the conversations. Hey, I get a chance to talk to Amy. I just need to ask her that one thing. Well, you know what? I don't get to see her anymore. You know, she's in a different location. Uh, Zoom meetings don't facilitate that same sort of natural organic interaction. And so that also is a change in behavior, which there's only so much Teams and Slack and texting and email and other forms of communication uh, that can overcome that because those organic, I ran into so-and-so, or I'm hoping to run into some, so-and-so, um, aren't happening. So how do, you, how do you help facilitate that more organic connection that, that we're all aware of, we've all experienced a, a hundred times or a million times, uh, that is, uh, in some sense, uh, promotion of 
a specific process that I'm or a specific tasks that I'm trying to achieve, but there's also a level of business trust, personal trust, personal yeah. connection that is embedded within that. One of the things that I've noticed in a lot of the Zoom calls is that there's a little bit more personal connection that we have with each other. I can see your your sophomore over your shoulder working on something over here. A lot of times we see a guitar hanging up or yeah. a piece of artwork that we can connect to. Um, is that the replacement? Uh, that's actually really interesting. Uh, so for my company, you know, we are in that kind of 20 to 25 people space. We've got, you know, people in India, people in New York, we've got people in Minneapolis. Uh, we actually have more customers overseas than in the U.S. today because of the multinationals we're working with. And so I'll say pre-pandemic, our life was still largely through Zoom. I would drive to my office to be on 10 Zooms in a day and then drive home. Now the <laughs> I just stay home have the, have the and Zooms. And, uh, and like, but one thing I've observed is that because of those uh, background items, uh, in you know, kind of not the sterility of being in, in the traditional office, I've noticed the dialogue has become more personal. And maybe it's because of those background items. Maybe it's just because we're all craving personal connection and we're trying to uh, supplement um, you know, through the technology. But the other thing is that you know, when we say that the water cooler chat is gone and the you know, opening five, 10 minutes into a conference, um, you know, when people are walking in or walking out, those things are lost. Um, you do see particularly, you know, teams. Uh, I think about pre-pandemic, I don't think I remember people talking about using teams as a form of right. you know, interaction and in teamwork. And, you know, be before that, you know, chatter, yammer, and certainly ubiquitous to that is Slack for certainly smaller and mid-sized companies. And you're seeing some of that dialogue go there. It's not as personal, but it's functional and it's required. Yeah. And then some people are good about it. Some people aren't. One of the things that we're adjusting for in the technology is that, like for us, you know, we've created this AI that you can just talk to. You can say, you know, um, you can ask Lucy a question and say, uh, you know, do you have the, you know, Q4 2020 uh, reporting on, you know, on audience versus product X and, you know, market Y? And that's done through a traditional web interface. Well, one of the things that we're doing on our roadmap to account for this is we're now allowing people to, um, or we will soon be allowing people to ask Lucy, not through the web interface, but through Teams, you know, to be able to do an, an at Ask Lucy along with asking other, you know, colleagues yeah. in the business so that not only does, um, you know, are you hoping for the organic interaction of people to respond to, hey, does anybody know where that report is? But also I'm gonna throw in an integrated technology that can answer that question as well. Yeah, the the death of the bar bet, bet has been Alexa, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, <laughs> and you guys are going to be the 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 death of the I I got it all in my brain. So, uh, uh, well, you certainly are going to supplement it because the problem is that not everybody responds, or you know, the people yeah. who can't respond don't know the answer sometimes. Let's, let's move on to uh, the idea of mo automation, and I'm cognizant of the time here, so I'm going to press this just a little bit. Um, from this year's GRIT report, we know that uh, technology and automation has been the big winner. It's uh, We've seen the, the time and money put into that uh, and, and a lot of growth in that area of research. Uh, I think we can all see a number of pros to automation and the most obvious to kind of being cheaper and faster. Um, and and uh, the word that often goes along with that is better. And now I don't, I think in some cases that's true. In some cases it's less true. But what do you see as the additional pros or how would you build out that word better a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, if you think about it, over the last, you know, over the last century and beyond, but let's just say the last century, there is an ongoing effort towards automation in business. Period. Uh, anything that can be repeatedly done with technology is. And so, when I say a century, I mean at some point products were built by hand, and they had the early factories, and you had early automation and better assembly lines, and that process has been never ending. Now we get into 
you know, even in the last couple of years, there have been significant efforts in the research and insight stack to adopt new technology that furthers the form of automation. How can I make, uh, you know, how can I provide better access to data? How can I, um, how can I take processes that were labor intensive and manual um, and make them repeatable? Uh, how do I, you know, cause we're always expecting more work from fewer people and there's just this unyielding push towards automation. Now, one of the things that we look at when it's better is if people can get access to data and do their job more efficiently, if they can convert what would otherwise be um, hours or days of the minutia and research, just digging through. I, okay, I got to go to the SharePoint. Now I got to go to Insider Intelligence. Now I got to go to Mintel. Now I got to Green Book. Now I got to go to, you know, and, and take all of that. And if I can turn hours and days into minutes so that people can spend more time on the intellectual function of what to do with the data rather than just the, um, the lead work of trying to get it on their desk to begin with. Then if you're saying better, well, that's what I say is better. It's not that the machine does the work for people from a standpoint of processing and thinking about what does the data mean? Um, it's gonna say, what do they do? So all the data gathering can happen in seconds and minutes versus hours and days. And then people can do the heavy lifting. They can say, now that I've got all this in front of me, oh, that's a great excerpt from Mintel. That's a great report from Green Book. Um, I've got these three PowerPoints. I didn't know my colleagues made these in the last six months. I've got those. Now, what am I gonna do with it? Um, if we can take the drudgery of getting to that and make that an exercise in a matter of you know, 30, 60 seconds, that's pretty fantastic. And we think we've made things a lot better for people. So uh, you do bring up the, the yellow flag um, of sometimes the, the automation isn't all that it's cracked up to be. So uh, what are the concerns that people should be cognizant of as they're moving to build more and more automation into their processes? Yeah, we spent a lot of time talking to companies about this, both our customers, our prospects, as well as customers of our competitors. And the thing that people fear most or the thing that, that mess up these efforts the most is when the effort to create automation is greater than, uh, is so much work that is greater than the benefit. Uh, one of the things we see, and this doesn't apply to our technology, but one of the things we see with competing in technology is there's a huge effort around curation of data, a huge right. effort around uploading and tagging of data. Well, if I have to upload and tag or curate, ultimately years of data for a Fortune 1000, which is gonna be millions of pages of content, it means taking the people that I'm trying to benefit and turning them into librarians or catalogers. Uh, and nobody wants to do it. They don't have the time. They don't do it consistently. Uh, we actually think that the, uh, the death of these systems or the key failing is the need to, um, to curate and upload because it's just too much work. And so why do I have to invest all of this work just to get to the benefits of automation? So one of the things that you mentioned in that conversation was the the data gathering component. If we can move it from hours or yep. days or weeks um, into minutes and seconds, uh, that starts to move into that third uh, category that you talk about in this area, which is data democratization. Yeah. Um, and under the the scenario that I laid out at the beginning of some of the issues that. Uh, researchers have been dealing with during this pandemic, you know, utilizing existing data, uh, searching for quick answers, budget constraint, those kind of things. I want to uh, make sure that we re we hit that again, because I think that that is a piece of the, the, the rationale behind data democratization. And additionally, uh, and I don't want to get uh, anyone too riled up here, but researchers are often seen as a congestion point for getting the appropriate information into an organization or into the, the right person's hands. And, and we've heard this from a, a number of different sources. So given that background, kind of what is your definition of data democratization and what concerns do you think need to be addressed for the research community to 
to stand behind data democratization to a higher degree. Yeah. So when I think data democratization, I think about how companies have amazing assets available to them. Those assets can be the historic data that they've generated, whether it's from the insight teams, the marketing teams, it's been provided by their agency partners and research vendors. Uh, and so in theory, any one company has all this data and they have it in systems, but it's locked up. It's locked up because only a certain portion of it is known by any individual. Uh, and it's locked up because it's not easily and readily searchable. And then you throw on top of that, not only the stuff that they've previously generated or received from partners, it's also the stuff that's syndicated uh, that are in the subscriptions. And so the is state today is for the typical insight professional, They, if they have a question to ask, they think about, okay, do I go to SharePoint? Which volume in SharePoint? Do I go to vendor A, B, C, or D? Do I go to this tool? Do I go to all of them? If I get lucky, do I find an answer? You know, I'm getting stacks of documents. And, and so, you know, democratization today is, 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 it's forced into silos of what do I know and what do I have access to? And so when we think about how data is democratized, we're saying, how can we unlock that? The company owns the data. They have the subscriptions. How do you make it available to everybody? How do you make it accessible? Now, there are going to be certain security requirements. You know, only so many people have seats to certain subscriptions, or there's going to be um, certain barriers where people only have um, authorization to certain volumes or folders in their environment. But beyond that, um, data is still today locked up because if I don't know it was created, I can't find it. I don't know where I don't know, know where to go. And so if I bridge these two items of data democratization and automation, the way we approach the world is say, let's use automation to make sure that all those subscriptions and all of the data that lives in the SharePoints and boxes and Office 365 and OneDrives and things like that, let's use automation to make that data available to people and let them ask questions and find the answers from wherever it is. And then we see democratization. What we see in the real world is we see people that ask the question, they say, oh, I, I knew that existed. I didn't know how to find it. But also, I didn't know that existed. That's fascinating. That's exactly what I needed. You know, my colleague Joe worked on this thing. I didn't know Joe worked on that. Or this, this or another person in my company, I didn't even know they existed. You know, they're in the London office. And they did this great study three months ago. This is exactly what I was looking for. And so data democratization becomes, how do I get access to all the data? And more often than not, it's the data that you hope exists, but you don't know exists and wouldn't know how to find. So um, let's switch gears just a little bit um, and put you on the spot. So uh, <clears throat> you mentioned three uh, key technology uh, initiatives, and we've talked about those three. What one or two priorities did not make the list that you thought might? Yeah, it's uh, um, it's going to end up being uh, how to drive uh, new technology adoption and really behavioral change. You know, it's one thing to say these are the things that are going to influence us and to look in the crystal ball and say, OK, our, our behavior is going to change. There's going to be the unyielding drive towards automation. So what does automation mean for us? And we want to get data into people's hands. But there's another element of all of this, which is how do we change people's behavior? Uh, one limited, a limiting factor to the democratization, and you kind of hit on in your comments, is that the insight professionals today are the ones that have access to all, to, the, to all the data. And then the people in marketing or sales or other functions in the business rely on them to deliver it to them. Well, what if, what if those people are critical to the deep insights, but the marketer can ask the question of the technology? They're not used to it. They're used to going to the person. And it isn't just a stand up the new technology and make an announcement. It's actually we have to drive behavior change. We have to drive behavior change for any of these new technologies coming in because the way we work for sometimes insights professional, the work was call a third party, hire somebody to do it. But we already have the data. Sometimes it's the marketer. Um, I'm expecting somebody to do the job for me. I'm going to have the alligator arms. 
uh, and wait for somebody to do it for me. And we're looking, moving into more of a DIY environment. So how do they do some of that themselves? How do they do more heavy lifting? Uh, how do they allow the insights people to go deeper and they can do some of the stuff themselves as well? But it requires behavior change because if you never had a system that did this for you, um, you're going to go back to your old habits. Absolutely. And it's um, it turns out that marketers and researchers and everyone else are all humans and, and humans are reluctant to change. So uh, I, I hope you can get that one figured out next. Scott, <laughs> I want to thank you for your time uh, and your insight on this. Everybody, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you for the next one. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.